saying, don't tase me, bro. <laughs> Thank you, people under 30. Uh, so I'm going to uh, very <laughs> rapidly describe some work that I've been doing with Jay Adam Cobb. He's the tallest guy in the room over there. You'll know him because he's sitting next to Mark Levine. So, um, what we have done is discover the master key to understanding the link between corporate structure and inequality. You're going to hear it right now. Uh, we refer to it as the paradox of hierarchy because we looked at it and said, that can't be right. Uh, but it turns out empirically it, it does seem to be right. Because I'm scrupulously neutral as a social scientist, I'm not going to say whether rampant, raging inequality is a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you uh, where it originates. So uh, what do we mean by inequality? Uh, all social scientists use exactly the same measure if they're paying attention. It's the Gini index of inequality. Gini index is the percentage of that area under the diagonal line that's gray. Uh, so, uh, it's uh, basically a measure of the dispersion of incomes if you line people up from lowest to highest income uh, and then drive this, draw this Lorenz curve, that gives you uh, the Gini index. Everybody's pretty familiar with that. The nice thing about it is that it gives you a metric that's, uh, that's comparable across countries to tell who's more or less uh, unequal. Uh, how do countries differ in their levels of inequality? The answer is uh, a lot. And every chart that you look at, the U.S. is this bizarre outlier that the U.S. tolerates levels of inequality that you really only see, you don't really see much in, in, in the rest of the world. Certainly, if you look at OECD countries, the U.S. is this weird outlier. There we are, second from the bottom, second only to Singapore. You'll discover that Singapore and Hong Kong are even freakier outliers in the U.S. on every chart you look at. But the U.S. is fairly peculiar. You see Japan. Uh, the Scandinavian countries up at the top. Um, so there's a lot of variation around inequality. There's a, folk, uh, there's a folk theory that inequality is just the price that you pay for prosperity. That if you're going to be rich, you're going to get inequality. That's the story of the US. If you cap incomes, if you tax uh, people at, at the top, it'll make them lazy. They, they'll go all Ayn Rand on you and move to Colorado and, and uh, destroy society. It turns out the empirical evidence of, on that is pretty dicey. If you can see this, oh, got the laser thing you know. Uh, so you see Singapore and Hong Kong are the bizarre outliers, but basically in most of the world, uh, the higher the GDP per capita, the lower the level of inequality. Rich countries tend to be more unequal other than the US and city states. So it's really the opposite. Equality generally increases with GDP per capita and with greater democracy. Um, what causes inequality? I hope I've got your attention, because we have the answer now. <laughs> uh, the, the standard answer uh, from the left, which all of us love uh, the most, if, if we have emotions as social scientists, is that it's entirely attributable to the decline of unions. Every bad thing is because of the decline of unions. So if you look at this diagram, green is the level of union density. In the US, it's gone down every year but one since 1958. But inequality goes up and down and up and down. It does not really track uh, the thing very easily. As of January 2010, most union members in the US are public employees. So we're really at an odd state in the US. I mean, yeah, you know, if you look from 1980 onwards, there's a perfect correlation. But if you look at the years from 1950 to 1980, it's a perfect correlation in the other direction. So empirically, it's tricky to make that claim. Um, we have an OMT based, since I'm an OMT guy, an OMT based alternative explanation. And we wanted to get at the nature of uh, corporate structure to see how it's linked to inequality. So we came up with a simple measure that you would have thought someone had come up with before, and it turns out they haven't. Uh, so we wanted to get at a measure of corporate structure in society is corporate uh, employment concentration. It's basically the number of workers employed by the N largest firms divided by the total labor force. So what percentage of the workforce works in a small number of companies? Surprising finding is that there's a very high correlation between employment concentration using the 10 biggest, 25, 50, or 100 biggest firms. Turns out that if you just look at the 10 biggest firms in an economy, you get a pretty good thin slice of what goes on in the rest of the economy. That's great for measurement purposes, because it makes it a lot easier. It's easy to get 10 firms. If you go to Colombia or Uganda, it's pretty hard to get the 100 biggest firms. So that's our measure of employment concentration. It turns out that this varies wildly around the world. 
uh, countries vary unbelievably in their ability to grow and sustain large businesses and employ people. On the left is Colombia, they're the largest, uh, they're the most unequal country in the sample that we look at. The biggest domestic company has 7,000 employees and a labor force of uh, uh, 22 million. Denmark, the biggest domestic employer at this time was 273,000. It's now 550,000 in a population of five and a half million. So I can Denmark grow half million person companies, Colombia 10 times as big, the biggest firm is 7,000. So there's clearly a whole lot of variation that is quite, I think, intriguing. Here's what we've discovered is that around the world, the bigger the relative size of the employer is, the lower the inequality. This is the paradox of, of inequality. Com countries defined, uh, described by tiny firms are much more unequal than countries that have giant firms. We're going to skip the causality for a moment. I just want to establish the pattern. So you've got the Latin American countries up there. Asian countries, don't. there is no Asia. I think that construct of Asia no longer makes sense, but that's a longer story. Uh, old Europe, as uh, they call it. The Kanye corner, they're kind of the outlier that ruins our regressions, but that's the former Eastern former Soviet countries that are very equal, uh, but don't have big domestic employers because it's Hyundai and Volkswagen and so on. Uh, and then the Nordic countries, we have one minute. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then there's North North America. The lower one is Canada, the civilized world, and the upper one uh, is the United States. Our closest neighbor in this is the Russian Federation, which is surprising. All of this stuff varies a bunch by flavors of capitalism. It seems to map onto formats for doing capitalism. This is a Lovelace uh, form of uh, uh, flavors of capitalism. In the US, if you look over time, the correlation between employment concentration and income inequality is negative 0.89. I've never seen a correlation like that in the wild in the social sciences. Very strong link. Big firms, lower inequality. And if you look at the history of US corporations over the past few decades, you can see how this happened. Conglomeration led to greater equality. Bust up takeovers and layoffs led to uh, greater inequality. A tentative factoid that we want to close with are uh, that corporate size varies a lot around the world in intriguing ways that haven't been much examined. That employment concentration is positively related to equality very strongly in the US and somewhat around the rest of the world. Size of the country's largest corporations and its level of inequality are linked to its variety of capitalism. And we've got this possible fuzzy causal chain that varieties of capitalism imply a particular concept of the corporations. That leads to levels of corporate size, big or small, and that in turn uh, is linked to inequality. So that's for us the, the empirical thing that we want to test. Uh, Adam's got this wonderful website, I write down worldinequality.org. We're trying to do an open source form of data collection to get other researchers involved. We're sharing all of our data. Maybe you could share with us. We could have big stone soup data collection efforts. Um, I can't remember why I put that in there, but uh, <laughs> I guess this is the lead into the next speaker, so thanks. <laughs>